In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee and his brother Philip ruler of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis and Lysanias ruler of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of the Lord came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight, Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The word of the Lord. When I was in grade school and in high school, I detested history class. It was my least favorite subject of all times. I never understood why I had to memorize the names of a bunch of dead people and know all of the significant dates of their lives. My history teachers seemed bored with their own subject, preferring to coach track or the wrestling team instead. History seemed so disconnected from my life, and no one could ever really adequately explain to me why it mattered. We had to learn it because we had to learn it. Our parents learned it before us, their parents before them, and so it was to be. History never made any sense to me either. For instance, I learned in school that Columbus discovered America. And then I was dismissed and threatened with discipline when I asked how Columbus could have possibly discovered America if the American Indians were already here. I was that child. Needless to say, what I really learned in my history class was to take it for granted to do whatever I needed to do in order to pass the class. It wasn't until I was an adult in graduate school that history began to become alive for me. I finally had a professor who loved it, and her love for the subject was contagious. It caught me off guard, and often I found myself awake at night thinking about all of the ways in which the world has been connected throughout time and space by threads of history that affect and effect all of us. So that being said, I completely understand the natural inclination to want to skip over the first two verses of our reading from the Gospel of Luke this morning. After all, those verses contain a lot of hard-to-pronounce names that have little or no meaning to most of us, and so we tend to quietly let them go, allowing them to slide into the background of our reading like bad elevator music or someone just saying blah, 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 rather than allowing them to convey to us a sense of history. The author of Luke, though, clearly wants to send a message here at the beginning of this chapter when he recounts the name of not one or two or even three but seven particularly located historical figures. He places them in the foreground of this story that's going to set the stage for the rest of the entire Gospel of Luke, begging for us to notice them. These 
are the names of the people who represented all of the power and tradition and threat of the Roman Empire. Tiberius was the self-proclaimed ruler of the empire, the divine ruler, no less. He expected to be worshipped. He squashed any dissent with his armies at a moment's notice. And in Luke's time, he was building a grand and beautiful city on the coast designed primarily to extend Rome's power as far as it could go. Everything and everyone seemed within his reach. Pontius Pilate a name we're familiar with, the man who sentenced Jesus to death for the sake of expediency and false peace. Then we have the Herod family, conjoined to Roman power, brutal to all opposition, willing to murder their own family members to still keep the throne, and also willing to behead the opposition for the entertainment of the court. Lysanias. This one's a little bit more of a mystery, but we know that he had a Greek background and that his family had connections to Cleopatra, which also indicates that his family was at the heart of political and military intrigue that so often brought suffering to the rest of the population. And then there are the surprise names, Annas and Caiaphas, religious leaders, high priests from the ruling class. What are they doing here? They had a stake in keeping peace with the oppressor, and they were willing to sell out any voice that gave hope to those who were living on the margins. Seven seats of wealth, power, and influence packed into one sentence, a list of who's who among religious, political, and economic, and religious power players at the center of authority as Luke's audience would have known it. A list of seven people who were posed to be the ones to receive God's word. And yet, this author points out that none of them do receive it. God's word doesn't come to any of them. It comes to John in the wilderness. See, this gospel writer is very interested in making us think about power, where it comes from, who has it, and what real power looks like. And spoiler alert, it doesn't look anything like we think it should. It is in this gospel in particular, that the author sets us up to see things, even through the historical lens, a little bit differently. God's word is proclaimed through babies and barren women, through unmarried pregnant teenage girls, through people who wander in the wilderness, and through wild-eyed prophets. And that's just the first three chapters, which gets us ready then to see that real power can be proclaimed by fishermen and tax collectors and prostitutes and by executed criminals and by terrified and grief-stricken friends who peek only into the tomb after all of their hope is lost. It is ordinary people to whom God's word comes. It is ordinary people to whom God's power is revealed. In this gospel, we learn it is ordinary people who dare to tell the stories of their faith and who carry the history of the world on their shoulders that proclaim the real power 
of the gospel. God works through ordinary people to transform the whole world. This past Tuesday night was committee night and chat and chew here at St. Barnabas. Now, chat and chew is a fairly new thing, so some of you might be unfamiliar with it. If you serve on a committee, or you want to serve on a committee, or you need to talk to someone on a committee, then you're invited on the first Tuesday of every month to come at 6 o'clock, an hour before committee meetings begin, and enjoy a wonderful meal, usually prepared by our own George Christ. And that might be one of the best things about it, but there's more to it than that. All committee members and potential committee members and those interested are invited to share a meal and to share in fellowship and discussion about all of the ways we perceive God is at work in our own lives and in our community. This past Tuesday, though, was a very special chat and chew. Because this month, all of those who have been recently elected to serve in the ordered ministries of our church as elders or deacons shared their faith reflections. This is required of anyone who is elected to serve. Now, this is always something that gives the newly elected great angst. Most often people wonder what they should say, what they should talk about. Should they recount the whole history of their faith or should they tell about one particular instance in their life of faith? Some worry that their stories are not worth telling at all. Some worry that they will get emotional when they tell their story and others worry that their stories are not emotional enough. But something fantastic always happens when we share our stories, and everyone comes away from the night feeling differently than they thought they would going into it. See, sharing our stories Sharing our history allows us to glimpse God's real power, not only in our own lives, but to come away with a real sense of how God has been actively changing the world through other people's lives, one ordinary person at a time. See, there's something audacious about this history with which the author of Luke begins this gospel. It starts with situating his narrative within the accepted narrative of all of the historical figures of the day. Now, the author of Luke, more than any other gospel writer, strives to purposefully convey a sense of history throughout his gospel. And he begins this chapter giving us some of the same historical information that any other non-Christian writing of the same time would have included in its history. And it's important then to note that in the first century, history was written not so much as to convey events as they happened in chronological order, but rather to make a point, to teach a truth, to draw people in a community narrative and place them within the framework so they would know where they belong. Now, history was always written from a position of power. So power is part of the name of this game. By placing the beginning of the Christian story into the larger narrative of the story of the world as people in Luke's time would have known it, allowed this author to make a rather bold statement that all of these 
seemingly small and insignificant events that shape our faith deserve a place in history right alongside the earthly figures that we think have the power to shape all of our histories. The author of the Gospel of Luke prompts us to consider what the birth of two small babies or the ministry of a prophet who wanders in the wilderness or the words of a carpenter's son, or the terrified proclamation of women leaving a tomb have to do with the kings and the emperors and the governors and the high priests, to which he tells us absolutely everything. This author invites his readers, both from the first century and those who read today into a story that can redefine and encourage and challenge all of our assumptions about power in ways that have the ability to change the history of the world. Audacious. This is a story about our history that can change what we think and what we say and what we do and what we believe. And it all begins as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled Every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. It's an interesting choice of words, I think. All flesh shall see, shall experience in real time with our senses, the salvation of God. Salvation history is not just something that we learn so that we can know it and take it for granted as if salvation were something we attained only after we die or something we confess only in a creed that has nothing to do with our real lives or something that we work to attain for the purpose of guaranteeing for ourselves a future. No. Salvation history is something we participate in, something so connected to us that we can sense it, see it, hear it, feel it, taste and smell it. All flesh shall see the salvation of God in the world in which we find ourselves among history as we know it. At Advent, it's good for us to remember that preparing the way of the Lord means acknowledging that even the seemingly small and insignificant events in the lives of very ordinary people have the power to transform the landscape of the whole world. For it seems that the promise of salvation much like the promise of incarnation that we celebrate at Christmas, marches right into this world in which we live and claims its rightful place as audacious history. Amen.